I'm not scared of dying. At the, at the most, I'm scared of living too long where I can't decide for myself what I want to do about things. Chuck Jackson has early onset Alzheimer's. At 53, the disease has taken his work, sped the ruin of his marriage, and now forces him to spend most of his time at home in Albany, Oregon. The doctors have told me they didn't think people could feel it. I told them they were wrong. It becomes like t taking over the brain completely to a point where I don't have any concentration at all. More than 200,000 Americans now have a rare form of Alzheimer's known as early onset. Most Alzheimer's patients are in their 70s or later, but early onset can strike as young as the mid-40s. Scientists don't know what causes early onset in most people, but Chuck's case is unique. His family has an unusual genetic mutation that almost always triggers the disease. He had Alzheimer's. She had Alzheimer's. He had Alzheimer's later in life. He had Alzheimer's. My mother had Alzheimer's. Of his mother's generation, 10 of 14 siblings had Alzheimer's, most of it early onset. In fact, Chuck's family was so riddled with the disease that they caught the attention of a small group of scientists trying to understand how Alzheimer's attacks the brain. What they uncovered was a remarkable story of how the most rare and virulent form of Alzheimer's came to America. There was a real detective mystery kind of piece to it, yeah, sort of a, a genetic detective novel, if you will. Dr. Thomas Bird is a researcher at the VA hospital in Seattle. In the late 1970s, when most scientists were looking for environmental causes for Alzheimer's, Dr. Bird went hunting for genes. Uh, and at that point, no genes had been found for any human diseases. So the idea that Alzheimer's might be genetic and that we might be able to find the genes for it was kind of a, a shot in the dark. At the time, the task seemed nearly impossible, but Dr. Bird got a lucky break. I was sitting in the living room in this farmhouse in Oklahoma chatting with the wife whose husband had died with Alzheimer's disease, and I asked her what was the family ethnic background. She said, well, my husband's family was, came from Russia, but they weren't Russians. They had all settled in these villages along the Volga River, and they often referred to themselves as Volga Germans. And a light bulb literally went off in my head because back here in Seattle, we had had two other families that had given me that same story. Chuck's family was one of those stories. And when he was only 14, he had to deal with the stark reality of his mother's Alzheimer's. She ran away from the house, tore all, took off her trail clothes, and she crawled into a, a culvert. And I had to pull her out of that, get her clothes on before any of the neighbors saw. She wanted to die then. Instead of praying for a cure, I started praying for a, good, a death. And there's a lot of guilt that comes from that at some point, to think that you'd prefer someone to die rather than continue to go through that kind of anguish and pain. Dr. Bird began hunting down other Volga Germans that might have also had Alzheimer's running in their families. And pretty soon we had five or six families with this same theme, Alzheimer's disease, early onset, Germans from Russia. After eight years analyzing their DNA, Dr. Bird's team came to a startling discovery. They all essentially had this exact same mutation and at number one it confirmed the hypothesis that they were all related and they all had the same disease and it was the discovery of a gene that caused Alzheimer's disease. The mutated gene is unbelievably rare. Of the more than two million Volga Germans living here, fewer than 200 have it. Yet the discovery of this gene and two others found elsewhere shed important light on how the disease may attack the brain. We've learned that genetics is important, and we've learned that the proteins that these genes control are important. That protein is amyloid beta, and for Alzheimer's patients, the chemical collects as toxic plaques in the brain. With Chuck's DNA, that process is in overdrive and gives researchers a target to slow down the disease. We've got protein, biochemical, 
targets. And you didn't have that 20 years ago. So it's a, it's, it's a huge step forward. That's not to say that any of the manipulations of those have yet cured the disease. They haven't. But the fact that you've got targets and that you can think about ways to manipulate them that might treat the disease is, in my mind, a, a huge step forward. But for Chuck and many with Alzheimer's, the steps forward aren't nearly fast enough. There's some of us that are saying, we don't want to take this anymore. We want to do something about it. It's got to be stopped. So Chuck and his daughter Rachel pack their bags and head to Washington. They hope to push Congress for research money and a bill that would protect Alzheimer's sufferers from genetic discrimination. That whole process of trying to decide whether you want to go somewhere and get tested and then have it possibly used against you by your insurance agents is very scary for people. Stay right down there. Nice to Pleased see to you. Meet you. Rachel has not yet taken the genetic test for Alzheimer's. She fears being turned um, down for insurance. Well, I, I've been told you know why we're here. I do. Yeah, we're supporting so the bill, too. We need that genetics protected, uh -huh. which you've been telling me is we're working on. talking about the Snow Bill, the mm -hmm. Genetic Non-Discrimination yeah. Act that has passed the Senate. I think it's in the mm -hmm. House. And it should pass the House this year. In the past, the Republicans have held it up. Well, the whole thing is, is that she, this other generation is coming up behind us. Yeah. And I'd like it to end there. I'd like it to end before she even has to even think about having the genetic testing, you know? We'll do our part. But That's my afternoon pills. Intercept, Naminda. No, no intercept. Razodine. Naminda. Alpha lipoic acid. I don't know. I'm losing it. At day's end, Chuck breaks down, recalling how hard it was to get tested for a disease with no cure. When I went for that test, it was against your mother's wishes, and she was very mad at me because she didn't want me to get it because of her fear. And I said, I want to know so I can tell Rachel if I don't have it, she doesn't have to worry about it. And if I do have it, I can make plans for the future because is this, this is my life, not yours anymore. And I think it was the beginning of our end of our marriage. Back in Seattle, Dr. Bird and his team are still hunting through Chuck's DNA. They believe it contains one last medical mystery, a genetic trigger for early onset Alzheimer's. There are some people in these families who develop the disease in their 40s. There are other people in the families with the same mutation, the same disease, and they don't develop it until they're in their 70s what factors are controlling this variability in age of onset. If you could find factors, genetic or environmental, that prevent Alzheimer's from developing for 20 or 30 years, you've got a treatment for Alzheimer's disease. You've got something that could really impact this disease. And so to find those factors uh, is, is quite important. After five years of separation, Chuck's ex-wife, Mary Ann, asked him to come back home so she could care for him. I really, I really care about Chuck. I love Chuck. I guess I just felt it, was, it just was the right thing to do. We're not going quietly to our grave with this disease. We're going to talk about it. And that's hopefully going to bring action. If not for me, at least it should bring some action for my daughter and the other children who are following other people with early onset. As of this broadcast, at least four drugs that attempt to reduce amyloid beta are in stage three clinical trials. As for Chuck, his condition has worsened. He now has trouble speaking and controlling his movements. Chuck's daughter, Rachel, has still not been tested for Alzheimer's.